All right, everybody. This is the last module of the semester, and I think that I'm probably going to consolidate this down to one video. Um, this is lipids and membranes. Now, lipids and membranes are kind of our, our last, or lipids specifically, our last of our uh, um, biological macromolecules. Um, and, and they kind of get like a, I don't know, an unfair shake. They're almost something that people are not as interested in. Um, but if you look at them as just like kind of the hangers on and the last ones, um, you kind of miss the point of them because they're, they're significant molecules. What makes them fundamentally different is in large part, they are mostly nonpolar, whereas most everything else that we've dealt with has largely been polar. Um, at any rate, Lipids are substances of biological origin that are soluble in organic solvents. So in an aqueous solvent, they're largely going to be insoluble. Now, lipids perform three major biological functions. They form a bilayer and are essential components of, lipid, of biological membranes. Lipids containing hydrocarbon side chains serve as energy stores, and many intra and intercellular signaling events involve lipid molecules. So you can look at this first one as they are protectors. They are, well, I don't really know how to articulate energy stores any other way than to say that they're energy stores. And then the last one, they are communicators. The K Taurus, yeah, there we go. Um, so they're huge with respect to everything and anything and everything that a biological system needs to do. Um, lipids are classified into a couple of different major groups. They are fatty acids, triacylglycerols, glyceroposphospholipids, sphingolipids, and steroids. Those are the major classes of lipids. Now, the first ones that we're gonna talk about are fatty acids. And one of the things that I think is really important anytime you look at a molecule is to break or look at a molecule and look at the name for it is break down where that name is coming from. First and foremost, actually second, is the word acids. Okay, so that implies that there is an acidic group, which implies that there's something that's ionizable. And every single fatty acid has this right here, this C termini. This C termini is our, our ionizable carboxylic acid. Now, the remainder of this molecule is for the remainder of all four of these molecules, they're hydrocarbons. Now, one of the things that I want to highlight with respect to these molecules is that they are all 18 carbons long. And that first carbon is their acidic group. So fatty acids are carboxylic acids with long chain hydrocarbon side, chain, or side groups. They're the predominant fatty acid residues in plants and animals are 16 and 18 carbons long. This is the first bit of nomenclature, a saturated fatty acid versus an unsaturated fatty acid. A saturated fatty acid has no double bonds. Saturated, no double bonds. An unsaturated fatty acid, on the other hand, has double bonds. So if we look at our four fatty acids over to the right, we've got steric acid, oleic acid, linoleic acid, and alpha linoleic acid, or alpha linolenic acid. Steric acid is saturated. Oleic, linoleic, and alpha linolenic are all unsaturated fatty acids. Now, this nomenclature, the notation that we use, consists of C18 colon and then a number. So, this first number uh, to the left hand side of the colon indicates the length of that fatty acid. So, all of these would start with C18. Now, the number to the right of our colon indicates the number of double bonds. So, 18, or I'll just write C18 colon 1 for oleic acid, C18 colon 3 for alpha linolenic acid. All of our double bonds are going to be in the cis configuration. The first double bond generally occurs between carbons number 9 and 10, and polyunsaturated fatty acids have double bonds that are not conjugated. So I'm not going to ask you to draw, but I will display these and ask you to convert a structure to this sort of notation right here. Now, 
maybe if you if you've taken a nutrition class or you've bought salmon or something like that, you've probably heard about the value of omega fatty acids. Now, this this terminology is something that we'll look at. Now, omega, if you think about it, it's generally uh, implied to mean the end or the, the conclusion. Well, that alpha and omega numbering scheme or our omega numbering scheme starts at the final carbon in our hydrocarbon side chain. So what this consists of is C16 colon one and minus three. That's what's displayed right here. We have carbon number one being our omega two and three. This is an omega three fatty acid. So this would also have the notation of omega minus three rather than N minus three. So with the other models that we were looking at, we were starting from carbon or our carboxylic acid one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we have different numbering schemes to indicate where the numbering begins from. The omega scheme starts from a methyl group and the other numbering scheme, which is known as the delta, which we'll get into in a little while, starts from the carboxylic acid group. Now, fatty acids, if they're saturated, they're going to pack very tightly together. They tend to form rigid organized aggregates. If we look at these models on the right-hand side, we've got an unsaturated fatty acid here versus a saturated fatty acid here. Unsaturated chains bend and pack in a less ordered way with greater potential for motion. As is exemplified here, we've got a saturated or a group of saturated fatty acids and a group of unsaturated fatty acids. These saturated fatty acids, we've got five of these molecules packed in this small space together, whereas five of our unsaturated fatty acids, the space that they're going to pack together is considerably greater because of these kinks. Now, one of the things that this is related to is uh, consumption and nutrition. Um, many times people argue against eating or consuming high concentrations of saturated fatty acids and instead suggest a diet rich in unsaturated fatty acids or polyunsaturated fatty acids. And the idea there is that, well, your saturated fatty acids pack so well together that you're going to consume a small amount of fatty acids and you're going to get a huge kind of dosage or huge amount of saturated fatty acids. So these molecules will pack really well together and you get huge amounts of energy. The problem is if that energy is not consumed, if that energy is not utilized, it's going to end up being, um, it's going to end up being stored in your body, ready to be used later on. And sometimes if you don't use that later on, well, then that just is more and more fat that's stored. Now, here's a list of your saturated, your common saturated fatty acids and unsaturated fatty acids. Now, I don't want you to know the names or anything for these molecules, but instead what I want you to look at is some of the trends. So if we look at the top here, we've got saturated fatty acids, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, and 24 carbons long. These have no double bonds. The names, and dodecanoic acid, and tetradecanoic acid, and then N-tetracosinoic acid. What I want you to recognize about these is that they're melting point. So at room temperature, these saturated fatty acids more than likely are going to be a solid. This, of course, is room temperature of about 23 degrees Celsius. Well, their melting point, 44.2. It's going to be a solid. Okay, what about when there's 14 carbons? then our melting point is going to go up. 16 carbons, 63 degrees. If we go all the way up to 24 carbons long, our melting point has escalated all the way to 86 degrees Celsius. So those are going to remain a solid for a very high, or until the melting point is very high. And this is something you probably, 
if you reflect back on when you were in your probably your first organic chemistry lab, um, when you used a melt temp or a melt temp, um, this may and you did melting point analysis. It's entirely possible that you you were using a fatty acid and watching for the melting of that fatty acid. So you have those little salt, those solid crystals, and you melted it, and you determine the melting point. Now, at the bottom half of this slide, what we've got are our saturated fatty acids or unsaturated fatty acids. Here we've got 16 colon 1, 18 colon 1, 18 colon 2, 18 colon 3, and 20 colon 4. So we've got one monounsaturated fatty acid, then one polyunsaturated fatty acid. So 16 carbons to 18 carbons. Let's look at that. Our melting point of those, when it's 16 carbons long, there's one double bond. Our melting point is about 1 to 0.5 degrees Celsius. So at room temperature, this is a liquid at RT. Now let's say we add two more carbons. We make that unsaturated, that monounsaturated fatty acid slightly longer. Now it's 18 colon one. It's 13.4 degrees. So our melting point went up. And so thinking about the top half of our slide and then the bottom, the beginning of the bottom half, if you increase the number of carbons, what happens to your melting point? It goes up. Now let's see what happens after that. We've got 18 colon one, and now we've got 18 colon two, 18 colon three. Our melting temperature 13.4, then it drops to one to five degrees, then it drops to negative 11 degrees. Okay, so all of these monounsaturated fatty acids are liquids at room temperature. As the number of double bonds increases, what happens to our melting point? It goes down. So the number of carbons, as the number of carbons increases, our melting point increases. As the number of bonds, double bonds increases, our melting temperature decreases. Now this is very important in order to analyze this. Our number of double bonds kind of takes precedent. So that's gonna steer the ship to a greater degree. Um, and so if you see something where you're comparing uh, fatty acids and you ask the question, well, um, which one of these is going to be a liquid at room temperature? Look for the one that has the greater number of double bonds because that's probably going to be a greater indicator of something being a liquid at room temperature. Now here's another display of that same sort of thing, a little bit less noisy, um, but here's that same sort of trend where we're seeing uh, DHA, Four, seven, 10, 13, 16, 19, a polyunsaturated fatty acid has six double bonds. It has a melting point of approximately negative 54 degrees. So the, yeah, polyunsaturated fatty acids are more than likely going to be a liquid at room temperature. Now, if we look at the same uh, saturated and unsaturated fatty acids, the C18 molecules that we previously looked at, I want to introduce another numbering scheme. And this is the delta numbering scheme. And the delta numbering scheme, I think, is uh, lots of folks find it to be preferential to the omega numbering scheme. The reason for that is this corresponds to this right here. Okay, so we've got one unsaturated or one double bond, and that double bond is found at delta nine. So counting from our carboxylic acid, counting up to nine. There we go. Now, as an 18 carbon long fatty acid, whether you start from the methyl group or the carboxylic acid, if you count up nine, you're going to place that double bond in the same location because from this end right here, this is carbon number nine. Okay, now with that in mind though, um, we've got this other numbering scheme. C18 colon two, delta nine comma 12. Okay, so this corresponds to linoleic acid. This says you've got a double bond at carbon number nine and carbon number 12. 
Whereas when we use the n or omega numbering scheme, what are we told? 18 colon 2, n minus 6. So again, starting from our methyl end, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, this is where people tend to deviate and say, I don't like the omega numbering scheme. Because this tells you where one of your double bonds is explicitly. It doesn't tell you where your other double bond is. The reason it doesn't tell you where your other double bond is is because of the fact that naturally occurring fatty acids are, I'm going to jump back, polyunsaturated fatty acids are not conjugated. So since they are not conjugated, what we can do, and what's implied here is that you have a double bond followed by a single bond, followed by a single bond, and then another double bond. So that's what you have going on there. And that's what's kind of implied with this scheme. And so what that means is if you take something like Alpha linolenic acid. You're talking about C18 colon 3. Now, just using the omega scheme, it's going to be 1, 2, 3. I'm going to write N minus 3. That's everything that you need for the omega numbering scheme. So this would also be written as C18 colon 3 omega minus 3. So those are interchangeable. Now, the delta scheme is going to have this, C18, colon 3, delta 9, starting from our carboxylic acid, comma, 12, comma, 15. So with the delta scheme, you're told explicitly of where every double bond is. And so that's why some folks find it preferential because it's explicit, it's intentional with displaying the information that you need. Now, fatty acids, one thing that's very important to recognize about them is they're, they're, a, biological major, or they're a biological macromolecule that does not polymerize. Now, they can be organized into higher order molecules, specifically known as triacylglycerols, also known as triglycerides. Triglycerides or triacylglycerols have glycerol as a backbone. Now, glycerol has three hydroxide groups. And we can take basically the carboxylic end of a fatty acid and place it or substitute that for these hydroxide groups. So we get something that looks like such where carbons one, two, and three have these three different fatty acids kind of bound to them. These are triesters of glycerol. These are, these mostly contain two or three different types of fatty acid residues. So as this is displayed over here, the one on the right-hand side, we've got a palmitoyl, linoloyl, steroidal glycerol. So, what that means is we've got on um, carbon number one, C16 colon one, because there's one double bond, and that would be delta nine. Now, position number two, we've got C18 colon one, two, delta nine, delta 12. Then this last one is a poly, or is a saturated fatty acid. Now, the biological role of triglycerols, well, if one fatty acid stores a lot of energy, three of them is going to store three times as much, approximately. Triacylglycerols for, function largely as energy reservoirs in animals. The fat content of a normal human allows them to survive or survive starvation for two to three months. Triacylglycerols function to insulate and basically keep the outside out and the inside in. Now, years ago in the mid-90s, I think it was like 95 or 96, 1995, 1996, there was a substance known as Alestra, which was a carbohydrate-based fat substitute. And people made Alestra or WOW was the branding. 
they made these chips that they didn't have uh, fat, but instead they had olestra. And but these chips were, uh, they had this fat that ultimately was something that really messed with people's guts and um, kind of became a, a bit of a joke. And they were, yeah, they were taken off the shelves not long after that. Nothing fatal, but nothing good. Um, so triacylglycerols in an industrial sense, they are processed and they can be processed and used to make soap. So if you've ever seen the movie Fight Club, they talk about this rendering process where you take triacylglycerols and you go through this process known as saponification, where you wash this uh, fat with sodium hydroxide, a strong base, and you from that get glycerol, as well as the sodium salt of fatty acids. Now, within outside of an industrial process, you have enzymatic hydrolysis done by substances known, or enzymes known as lipases. And what those lipases are going to do is they're going to release glycerol and they're going to make these ionic fatty acids. So there are also uh, polar and nonpolar lipids, triacylglycerols, glycerophospholipids, and sphingomyelins. Um, these all vary a little bit in, in terms of how polar they can be. For instance, if we look at something like glycerol, well, yeah, we've got these ester groups, but other than that, it's kind of hydrocarbon and hydrocarbon. So those polar groups are kind of nestled within. If you take something like a glycerophospholipid, well, you've got something that two thirds of it looks like a triacylglycerol, but the other part of it is a phosphate group plus something else. That would be considerably more polar. And then finally, a sphingomyelin. This is a little tough to visualize, but basically you have a uh, phosphocholine head group, which has a positive charge. So this is very polar. And then you have a fatty acid side chain, just the R group, just the hydrocarbon group. And so these would be considered, you know, with a larger polar, sorry, with a larger polar head group, probably the most polar of your, your lipids. Um, in general, your nonpolar lipids are going to be your energy stores. So triacylglycerols, great energy stores. Your polar lipids, on the other hand, are going to be the basis of your bilayers. So glycerophospholipids are the major lipid component of biological membranes. So when you talk about a lipid bilayer, you're actually kind of talking about glycerophospholipids. Glycerophospholipids, excuse me, are amphiphilic molecules, meaning they have both a polar and a nonpolar region. So they have nonpolar aliphatic chain tails and polar phosphoryl head groups. So if you take something like glycerol 3-phosphate, that phosphate group is where you can have a modification, but also where these hydroxide groups are, you can go through that esterification and add those um, fatty acids to those chains. So here are some examples of the common classes of glycerophospholipids. And really those classes boil down to what is the head group? What is this phosphate head group and how is it modified um, to basically get what you, you know, get different types of molecules. Um, and I don't expect you to know these despite, yeah, I don't expect you to know these, but I do want you to know that these are major parts of biological membranes. And these head groups, all of these different head groups are going to communicate to different things to different adjacent cells. And they're going to communicate different things to um, basically proteins that are nearby. Sphingolipids are major membrane components and they are derivatives of the C18 amino alcohol sphingosine which that's what we're looking at right here. Um, the basic unit of one built upon this and modified from sphingosine makes what's known as a ceramide. Sphingolipids 
they fall into groups of they fall into two major groups: sphingomyelins and cerebrosides. Sphingomyelins have head groups of phosphocholine or phosphoethanolamine. Cerebrosides have a head group. Strange that that appears. Have a head group that um, it's going to have a single sugar in place of that. And so you could have like glucose or galactose in place of this phosphocholine head group. Now, sphingolipids and gangliosides, I'm not going to expect you to know too much about these, or I'm not going to expect you um, to be able to answer about these, answer anything about these. But gangliosides are ways in which cells can communicate with one another. A head group with three or more sugars, um, sorry, these are uh, gangliosides. Gangliosides are primarily components of membranes on cell surfaces and constitute 6% of brain lipids. These act as receptors for pituitary glycoproteins that regulate physiological responses and functions. Gangliosides, the ways in which they are broken down um, or not broken down, ultimately to a ceramide, is implicated in a number of genetic disorders or genetic uh, diseases. Um, and so these can accumulate and cause substantial diseases and um, developmental disorders. Phospholipases, these are a class of molecules, specifically, they are a class of lipases that they use a phospholipid and cut a phospholipid or cut phospholipids in specific locations. I want you to know where these different phospholipases cut. So there's phospholipase A1. That is going to cut on a fatty ester. It's going to cut a fatty ester off. Uh, phospholipase C and phospholipase D, on the other hand, well, they will be cutting a phospholipid, but they're going to be targeting where that phosphate group is. Phospholipase A2 is effectively the same as phospholipase A1, but it's targeting the group on carbon number two. So phospholipase A1 and phospholipase A2, what they're doing, what they're releasing is a free fatty acid. Phospholipase C and D, they're not releasing a free fatty acid, but rather they're either releasing a phosphorylated head group or simply a head group. Phospholipase D only releases head group. Phospholipase C is releases phosphorylated head group. So those are what I want you to know about phospholipases. I'm going to go ahead and uh, proceed with this. Um, cells continually degrade and resynthesize membrane phospholipids and sphingolipids. Um, yeah, I want you to know where each of these different lipases are going to cut. So, in addition to the membrane related functions and energy related energy storage related functions of lipids, there are non membrane functions of lipids. Um, for instance, signaling lipids, lipid cofactors, and pigment molecules. Signaling lipids, um, an example are eicosanoids. These mediate inflammation, fever, and pain responses. Steroid hormones also are signaling lipids. They act as chemical messengers. Um, lipid cofactors, ubiquinone or ubiquinone, functions as an electron carrier in the electron transport chain. So in your breakdown of glucose, ultimately down into CO2. Um, ubiquinone is a, a big factor there. You've got pigment molecules that are in antioxidants. Vitamin A is an essential pigment for vision. Vitamin K functions as an antioxidant. Um, icosanoids, which are one of your signaling lipids, act at low concentrations and are involved in the production of pain and fever, uh, regulation of blood pressure, blood coagulation, and reproduction. These are produced usually and produced and used locally. And so what happens with these is a membrane phospholipid has um, basically your, your two components. 
and your polar head group, phospholipase A2 will come along and cut the, this uh, uh, sorry, we'll cut this fatty acid chain off of carbon number two on this membrane phospholipid. Then that resulting molecule is arachidonic acid. So specifically, this will cut a 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 carbon long fatty acid. So um, this 20 carbon long fatty acid, also known as arachidonic acid, will kind of devolve or be metabolized into prostaglandin E1, thromboxane e A2, or leukotriene A4. Now, there are drugs that prevent this. So specifically prostaglandin E1 and thromboxane A2. Arachidonic acid is converted to these through a class of enzyme known as cyclooxygenases. Now, your, your standard over-the-counter non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAIDs, will inhibit those drugs. So they will inhibit the production of prostaglandin and thromboxane. Um, Singular and Xyflo will also do this. Uh, cholesterol, another molecule based on a core structure consisting of three six-membered rings and one five-membered ring all fused together. Here's our three six-membered rings and our one five-membered ring. Cholesterol is the most common steroid in animals and a precursor for all other steroids in animals. Phytosterols produced by plants. Stigmasterol, bitocytosterol, beta-cytosterol, and camposterol are examples of phytosterols. And your steroid hormones are maybe your most well-known um, steroids. Steroid hormones bind to, or your, sorry, your sex hormones um, bind to specific receptor proteins in the nucleus, and uh, the nucleus regulating G expression and metabolism. It should be the yes. Um, major groups of sex hormones and those produced by the adrenal cortex. There are a handful of lipid soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, and these are all going to do different things. For instance, vitamin A serves in the site of primary photochemical reaction in vision and regulates calcium. Uh, vitamin D regulates calcium metabolism. Uh, B serves as an antioxidant necessary for reproduction in rats and may be necessary for reproduction in humans. And K has a regulatory function in blood clotting. Vitamin D, a group of structurally related comp uh, compounds that play a role in the regulation of calcium and phosphorus metabolism. 